in a manner which they can comprehend, which is in the office of the general executor and guardian as the sovereign of our own domain. But we are also something much greater than that. And we are a man or we are a woman. And that's what it means to be Eucadia. I mean, it's kind of funny to think because we think that a title like being called Lord or Sir or being called Your Holiness puts you at the top of the pedestal. And really, in, in reality, what Eucadia is doing is rebalancing and saying, when you stand as a man holding your trust number as a true trust, then you are an instance of the divine and you can be nothing greater than that. You can't be anything greater than that. So does that make sense to you? Oh, yes. You're basically uh, revoking the convocation, more or less, the three crowns. You're saying we're, you're revoking all, we're revoking all the presumptions that they've loaded on us, all that rubbish they've loaded on us, all those curses they've loaded on us, our children, and our parents, and our ancestors. We're destroying it in one foul swoop when we stand up as a man or a woman with free will, knowing that we are not only part of the collective of the divine, but you are an instance of the absolute divine immortal spirit. You are the divine creator. That is a fact. And they're not my words. They come from a general executive 2,000 years ago who said, I'm in you, you're in me. Couldn't make it clearer. Right. Okay, so so I don't know if this is exactly accurate, but the our Eucadian trust is the supreme trust, and the will and testament more or less could almost act as a trust underneath that divine, the Eucadian trust, in yes. order to interact with their matrix. Correct. So we're using that as a way. So, so in in a sense, that will and testament is subordinate to our Eucadian trust. Of course, which it is. goes of course directly it is. from the divine to the flesh and body man. Of course, it is. And this is where right. I get upset with people who, um, kind of you know, from a biblical sense, come across with all this kind of swagger and say, "I'm a man," and you know. You know, I, I, you know, God gave me granted dominion. Yes, I'm, I'm not only do I agree with that, but you're describing the mechanics, that the mechanics are necessary because they have perverted and subverted those mechanics. But that is exactly right. Because you are a man, because you are a, a man and you are part of the divine and you are the divine, as is your right, there is nothing greater than you. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Very good. good. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Dean. See you. Good night. Um, okay. We're going to wrap a little bit earlier tonight. So we're going to probably got about another 10 minutes uh, to go through what questions we have left and if anyone wants to speak live. But look, let me go through a couple more of the questions here before we wrap up. Uh, the question is from uh, Tom DeBom. He says, can you explain what role or relation the U.S. Corp, including the IRS, plays in relation to a state like Australia? Okay, yeah, really quickly, in a nutshell, the relationship to uh, the United States is that the uh, U.S. Uh, became the home for the chancery apparatus and the chancery apparatus is for the administration of the uh, property. And when there was a series of global bankruptcies declared, rather than the Queen of Australia, which is the name of the Australia estate, the Queen of Australia is its own estate, just as the Queen of Canada is its own estate. When the Queen of Australia, for example, a state, uh, was changed, the corporation Australia became the uh, functioning uh, government. And so everyone became agents of Australia 
and the estate became the holding company. So the bankruptcy was declared uh, to effectively get uh, control over the um, uh, control of the states, and so the registration of Australia as a corporation now, since the 30s, has been done through the state of Delaware. So I guess the connection is the um, Delaware and the apparatus in America really is managing the bankruptcies that came through for the um, trading corporations on top of the bankruptcy what was already in place since the 1816 of the crown itself. So that's the relationship. Every country is registered in Delaware. Australia has multiple registrations into Delaware and every five years there is a turnover uh, and all the reporting goes in there and the census data that was put in is done for a prospectus and then that, that, those um, values are then sold and commoditized through Delaware and the SEC and uh, you can go and find that in fact the, the uh, owners and the headquarters of Australia isn't in uh, Canberra, it's in uh, a little pokey office in uh, Newcastle or Wilmington in uh, Delaware. So that's a quick summary. I've probably cut through a lot of history there, but there's plenty of history on this on the internet and on University of Acadia. Uh, just see if we've got any more. We don't have any more callers on the line, so we'll just get through a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up tonight. Uh, Guest 7 asks, if forced to sign out of necessity, would you, for example, authorise like VC, R of the estate, Joe? Uh, yes, if you can get that on and they don't hit you over the head, great. If, they, if you can't get VC, then use the, the three dots, the uh, ellipsis. But I would um, definitely, if you're forced to sign necessity, try and get VC on your signature. But I think the lesson tonight is We've underestimated how significant the surname itself is for the system in presuming that we are happy to remain slaves. So we need to be clear and very careful in the way we use surname from here on in because it appears that the system is very particular. They will, they will ignore our behaviour even though our behaviour makes abundantly clear that we are certainly not to be treated as slaves, but they will view the fact that we use a surname without qualification that we accept and see that we remain slaves. Uh, question. Um, let's see other questions we've got here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I don't... Ah, oh, here we go. A question... Can the Eucadia banks be used for both Eucadian monitors and Roman monies? Yes, they will be. I mean, that's the whole point. The purpose is not to support the Roman banks, but certainly when one purchases the Eucadian money, one has several ways to do it. One can do it by uh, granting, uh, converting Roman fiat money to then purchase Eucadian, and that then gets put into accounts that are managed at a community level. So when one needs to uh, convert again, there will be abilities to convert back out again into Roman money, remembering that the incentive is to keep the energy within the system and not to allow leakage in or out. So the answer is yes, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a flexibility that a any community needs to survive, certainly to begin with. Um, and will they be available to make deposits? Yes, we call those deposits transfers and they're called concessions and exactions. They're the term. So for deposit, we use the word concession and for the word withdrawal, we use the word exaction because they are the correct terms to describe the function. Uh, question, will the UK banks be similar to what is used in the Roman system in terms of having transaction cards they're accepted worldwide. Yes, that is going to be a fundamental element in order to survive. Yes, it is a critical part that that is part of uh, surviving on the ground. I'm going to, I see that uh, Truth Matters to Me is up, so I'm going to unmute and then uh, we're going to wrap up with the questions in a moment.
Hi, Greg. Can you hear us? Hi, Frank. Yes, I hear you. I, I didn't want to jump in at the end, but I, I wanted just to say something and, and ask you a quick question. But I, I wanted to just thank you for uh, your strength of character because I know that the spirit uh, of the truth uh, sometimes comes out a little bit um, strong. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I, I just really appreciate you and your stance for the truth and um, the extreme care that you take in, in, in speaking with everybody, no matter how harsh they are. And, um, uh, uh, but I would just really would like to share that, that I, I feel that um, I've, I've been blessed to have some time speaking with you, and I have never been more excited in my life. And, and I've been on a quest my entire life. I'm going to be 56 next month. I feel like a little kid. And um, the joy that I get from learning with you and the group of people with Matt and Gerald and Ron and Lynn and, and everybody else. And I just, I just want to let you know that um, I've never sensed so much excitement about a transformation uh, that I feel is coming. And what we're doing with Eucadia is it. And uh, anyways, I just, so I just want to give 100% um, uh, bravo for how you've handled everything. And, uh, if it's at all possible to draw some fire away from you, I'd be more than happy to start drawing some fire away. So. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, don't appreciate, I, I do appreciate everything, Greg. Look, it does sometimes come across as a bit harsh, and I'm sorry, I, I do get emotional sometimes, particularly with, you know, there is, there is a lot of distractions in the world. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things in the world to make us upset, and I find that a challenge every single day. But... Uh, it's also important to put it in perspective too, and I, I know we've, we have discussed this. You know, when we speak in terms of history and we talk about challenging to the system, isn't it a sobering thought to, to recall that the last great effort in terms of challenging Roman law was Martin Luther? Yes. And that was 500 years ago, 500 yeah. You know, and, and I and I'm, I get stressed about you know the fact that I'm you know at wit's end about how I can pay rent in a month's time and all of that. But you know, 500 years really kind of puts you in a whoa. I mean, that's a long time. Yes. So I, I just hope I know that there you know there's uh, that's the reason I talk about the fun, my personal position is so that people realise to perfectly honest where I'm at so that you realize that I'm not sitting here just thinking this is all kind of la-di-da, but also I realize what it means to be focused on literally how do you survive today and tomorrow and the next day. Meanwhile, the challenge here is to do the best we can and to not compromise on the restoring of the law, to not compromise on the canons, to not compromise on the tools that we're developing because those tools need to not just survive for a week's time or a month's time when we turn things on, they're going to be around and sustain, hopefully, for hundreds of years uh, to you know, permanently balance things and hopefully then people will improve and, and come up with better ways. But Greg, I thank you for everything you're doing. I thank you for your encouragement um, as I thank everyone who is coming on and helping. It's, it, 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 it feeds my soul, Greg, to have the conversations with you and to feel from others as well. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I'd just like to throw one last thing in, Frank. And all those that are listening now, listen to the archives, and even those that are, think they're on the other side of us. What we are doing right now with Eucadia is we're literally freeing even those people that have acted as our enemies for the last thousands of years are being freed along with us. And if they could only stop for a moment and see that what we're offering is true true, true, true salvation from the hell that their system has turned our wonderful earth into, that they get to benefit and their children and grandchildren will benefit. Maybe they'll start, maybe some of them might pause just for a moment and go, why am I trying to hold on to a system that has been destructive since it began when there's an offering for something better for everybody, including those that were the perpetrators? Well, gee, that would be a great thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. we do... We, we do do that, and uh, as you know, we we work towards the fact that that the coming of one heaven is first and foremost for the benefit of those that have departed. It's for the benefit of spirits first. It's a benefit for the living second, 
and sometimes we get it mixed 